Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the EMEA Knowledge Representation and Semantics um, Working Group webinar. This is the first webinar in our webinar series on standard terminologies. And today, Dr. Berryman will um, talk about the link. First, um, I want to um, briefly introduce us. My name is Lee Zhou. Uh, I'm currently serve as the chair of the KRS Working Group uh, for EMEA. I'm working at Partners Healthcare and Harvard Medical School in Boston. And we also have Robert uh, Rota online. Uh, Robert is the director of EMEA uh, membership. He provides a lot of support for this event. Thanks, Rob. And uh, our speaker for today is Dr. Daniel uh, Werman. Um, he is a, an assistant research professor at the Indiana University School of Medicine and a research scientist at the Register Institute. Um, Dr. Berryman's primary research focus is on the role of standard clinical vocabularies to support electronic health information exchange. As associate director for terminology service at um, Registry, he directs the development of LOINC and provides leadership and oversight to terminology service that integrate the Indiana Network for Patient Care, a regional health information exchange in central Indiana. And Dr. Berman also teaches medical informatics at uh, Indiana University. And before the webinar, I will also want to let you know the talk will be last for 15 minutes. 15 minutes, we will leave 10 minutes for questions at the end. So if at that time when you have a question, please raise your hand, and I will let you uh, speak. And you can also type your questions in the question box. We will try to answer those questions as well. So let's get started. Um, Dr. Verman, please start your talk. Great. Well, thank you very much uh, for that nice introduction, and, and welcome to everyone who is um, participating in this. I'm happy to be with you today to, to give you an introduction to uh, LOINC. What I'm going to do is start by uh, talking a little bit about the origins and evolutions of LOINC, uh, then go into just a brief sort of LOINC 101, uh, mention some of the mapping tools and resources that are available to map local terms to LOINC, uh, and wrap up with a few closing thoughts. While I get to be the one telling you about LOINC today, this is uh, by no means a, a one-person show, and I wanted to start by acknowledging some of the other folks that you see listed on the screen here who have contributed to this work, including the team that develops uh, the LOINC content, as well as the software folks who develop uh, the Realm of Mapping tool, the LOINC committee members, as well as our funding supporters, um, principally the National Library of Medicine and Reagan Street. So. Reagan Street Institute, as the host organization of LOINC, uh, has been uh, uh, involved in biomedical informatics for a long time. And it's out of this um, uh, work in informatics and building data-rich systems for that the LOINC uh, standard grew out of. Uh, so I wanted to start by describing that a little bit, uh, some of the origins of LOINC. Really, the story starts. Um, about 40 years ago with Clem McDonald. Uh, and when he came to Reagan Street, he had this vision of building uh, computer systems that were connected to each other uh, in a seamless fashion. He coined the term canopy computing uh, and described this in more detail uh, in a JAMA paper in 98. This idea that he uh, started working on is, is the idea of creating uh, computer systems that functioned like the rainforest canopy. Uh, which is the seamless uh, uh, network or web through which arboreal creatures uh, can efficiently move to reach the edible fruits uh, without any attention to the individual trees themselves. Uh, and so the idea of connecting individual computer systems uh, in an interoperable way was uh, his vision for a long time. Uh, what, uh, what he started was work in a single diabetes clinic to develop um, uh, an electronic medical record system, and that system grew uh, over the years into a regional health information exchange that we call the Indiana Network for Patient Care, which today is probably the most comprehensive and longest tenured uh, information exchange in the nation. And during and in that work, Reagan Street has served as the neutral third-party convener connecting 
now about 80 institutions who are participating uh, in, in the network. And so when Clem started uh, building the connections between systems in the mid-1990s, uh, uh, he ran into uh, the problem uh, that's illustrated in this photograph here. Uh, so this is a, a photograph of our healthcare system today. Uh, actually, sort of yes and sort of no. Really, you can see it's a photograph of the railroad system uh, in the 1800s, which uh, at that time, many individual companies began building railroad tracks. Uh, and as they did so, they decided to set those tracks at different widths apart. They used different track gauges. And as a result of that, if you wanted to ship goods from one part of the country to another, you would inevitably run into these junction points where one company's tracks would end and another's would begin, and you would physically have to unload the cargo out of one train car set into another in order to, to continue moving those goods. And too often, that's exactly what our computer systems in healthcare uh, are like today, very difficult to have seamless uh, information flow. And so uh, Clem realized this and was working to, to um, solve this problem. And one solution to this is with messaging standards such as HL7 that defined uh, the syntax for how data can be moved from one system to another. And so um, after working on developing that standard uh, and using it in the hospital systems in central Indiana to begin sharing uh, laboratory and other data electronically, he realized uh, that that was great, um, but that there was another problem in store, uh, and that is when he looked inside those messages that were flowing from one system to another, the clinical content inside looked very much like a Tower of Babel, uh, where every individual system would come up with their own idiosyncratic names uh, and codes to identify the tests and measurements, uh, and this made it very, very difficult for the computer to understand the results from more than one system. Uh, and this was a challenge that he faced in, in the mid-90s and others here at Reagan Street because they were building the INPC. But really, this is a fundamental challenge that everyone who is trying to aggregate data from multiple sources faces, this fundamental challenge that local systems have different ways of identifying the same concept. But really, the only way to combat this problem uh, is through the use of vocabulary standard which could serve as the sort of Rosetta Stone uh, to translate between these local uh, parlances into uh, a unified language. And it was out of that local practical work uh, that Clem decided to launch um, uh, an effort to develop a terminology standard uh, to solve the problem not just for the folks in central Indiana, but for the, the entire community, uh, because there was no standard at the time for these kind of things. And so that was the birth of LOINC, um, logical observation, identifiers, names, and codes. It's a code system that's designed to facilitate exchange, pooling, and processing uh, of results. So it was established in 1994 um, by uh, the Reagan Street Institute, Clem, and a number of collaborators he gathered from around the world. And it's designed to be a vocabulary standard for observation identifiers. Our mascot is a, a pig, so uh, you can see it's it's uh, loink like oink, the sound that a that a pig makes, uh, and uh, you can tell you know it says press me. We're, we're sort of very inviting, and hopefully uh, this uh, webinar will be uh, your chance to press and and try us out a little bit. So what is loink uh, designed to do? Well, primarily uh, it's designed to distinguish things that need to be distinguished and aggregate things that need to be aggregated together. So if you take a look in a typical uh, test catalog or service catalog from two different laboratories, uh, you'll see names like this. Uh, you see in Lab A, you've got something called Lyme disease serology. And over in Lab, lab B, you've got something called Lyme disease antibody. And uh, if you're in this space, of course, you, everyone knows that an antibody test is a serology test. And so on the surface, these things look very much like the same. But then if you take a look uh, in, uh, under the cover uh, and see, well, over in Lab A, you're measuring IgG uh, using a LISA method that produces a quantitative result. Uh, and over in Lab B, you're measuring uh, IgM using an immune blot that produces a qualitative result. 
And so while on the surface these things look very much the same, they're not directly comparable. Uh, and these are the kinds of distinctions that LOINC is designed uh, to uh, distinguish among. And so these two different things would get different LOINC codes. Another way to say it is we're trying to identify things that have similar names uh, but yet different meanings. So we're trying to distinguish the meerkats from the mere cats. Another way to think about what LOINC uh, is designed to do is to think about questions and answers. So if an observation or measurement is a question and the observation value is an answer, then LOINC is designed to provide codes for questions. Now a lot of times the result or the value is a, is a numeric quantity uh, and you don't need um, another vocabulary for that, you just need the number and the associated units of measure. But in other cases, the, the answer to the question might be a coded entity uh, and LOINC largely leaves it up to other vocabularies such as SNOMED or ICD uh, to provide codes for the answers. So if you're thinking about this from um, a clinical laboratory perspective, your question might be, well, what's my patient's hemoglobin? And LOINC is going to provide a code and a structured answer for that, uh, a structured name for that kind of question uh, here, a hemoglobin uh, measurement. If you're thinking from a broader clinical perspective about tests and measurements, you might ask a question, well, how fast does my patient usually walk? And so LOINC is designed to provide a code and a structured name to identify that observation as well. Here I've given an example of a one-week average uh, walking speed might be a representation of this kind of question. So typically, if you want to send results from one place to another, um, what usually happens is a, a hospital or information system packages up those results uh, into an HL7 message. And so LOINC is designed, it was designed from the very beginning to fit within this context of, of messaging. And so just for those of you who aren't um, real familiar with what an HL7 message looks like, I've given an example here. It's ASCII text. Um, there's uh, the vertical bars uh, uh, delineate um, fields, uh, like database fields. And at the top of the message, there are segments that identify um, who the, uh, the originating system is, who the patient is that this is about, where it's going, uh, which physician it's being reported to, uh, and so forth. Uh, but if you uh, look down further at uh, what's called the OBR segment, the, the, um, the order segment or observation request, um, segment, you'll notice uh, this is where you can put a code in for uh, to identify that this is a, a CBC with auto differential. And because this is the result message coming back, what you see in the subsequent OBX segments or observation segments are the actual enumerated results from that panel. Uh, and if you look at um, the different fields, you notice that each one uh, includes a different kind of information. And so um, HL7 segments are referred to sometimes by their, their position, so OBX3 would be the third field uh, in this uh, segment. Uh, and if you look in that place, you see that there are um, two sets uh, of triplets for identifying what test this is, what measurement uh, is this being reported. Uh, and the first triplet uh, pertains to the local code, so you can send the, the local identifier your local test name and the code system identifies that this is a um, identifier created by, in this case, Hospital A. Um, but you can see that you're also able to send an alternate identifier, in this case, the universal LOINC code, uh, which is here you see the triplet, the LOINC code, the LOINC name, and the code system. And so side by side you can send here, this is the local name for this thing, and here is the, the LOINC code for this. It's also important to notice that uh, the actual uh, result, the value, uh, and its units of measure also have discrete uh, different fields uh, to be transmitted. So LOINC is designed to fill this place within the seven message of identifying what this test or measurement is. So I use that example um, as a quantitative example, and it works equally well for communicating things whose answers are coded values. Uh, and so uh, in this case, I've shown just a single OBX segment 
that has a coded element data type. And what that CE says is that if I, I look over in the OBX5, the results segment, what I'm going to find is a coded entry, uh, a coded element. And so the, the observation identifier here is coming from LOINC. So uh, what are these results? In this case, it's a uh, listeria culture. And then over in OBX5, you see uh, pairing that question uh, with the answer being a SNOMED code that identifies this particular organism. And so the simplest explanation of how LOINC and SNOMED and HL7 fit together is sort of this paradigm of uh, LOINC representing the question and SNOMED filling uh, the, the answer slot. So LOINC divides its work uh, into two uh, divisions, uh, the laboratory side and the clinical side. It's all one database, um, but we have committees that focus their, their work on, on these two spaces. And so laboratory LOINC includes um, essentially all of the things that you can measure about a specimen. Uh, whereas clinical LOINC includes all the things that you can measure or observe about a whole person, a patient. So the laboratory side uh, includes content um, from all of the things that you would normally think of in clinical laboratory testing. This wordle shows the relative number of codes we have in these different areas, such as microbiology, uh, chemistry, toxicology testing, and so forth. The clinical portion of LOINC includes a much wider set or uh, space of content uh, that you can see represented in this wordle. Uh, we have a, a significant number of terms covering radiology reports, um, as well as you'll see listed a number of different uh, standardized assessment instruments, survey instruments, uh, which don't show up as well because there are fewer numbers of codes in them, uh, but, not, uh, but equally important are things like vital signs, measurements you can make on um, OB or cardiac ultrasound, uh, EKG measurements, and so forth. The laboratory LOINC committee uh, is chaired by Clem McDonald, and the, the clinical LOINC committee uh, is chaired by Stan Huff uh, from, the, um, from Intermountain Healthcare and University of Utah. Clem is at uh, the Lister Hill Center at the National Library of Medicine. So I want to describe a little bit about how LOINC is developed and the community around it. And I typically use three words to describe that, open, nimble, and pragmatic. So open in the sense that from the very beginning, LOINC has been distributed uh, worldwide for free. Um, but open also in the sense that the development and the additions to uh, the database, um, the new terms that are added, are based on uh, submissions or requests from the end user community. Um, so we're not making codes or concepts for things that we think might be used someday. We're actually using, we're actually basing uh, the codes that we create off of terms that already exist in It appears as if Daniel's lost contact, um, so please bear with us. I think he probably just has to dial back in. Thank you. Time to the overall process. Link is supported um, uh, from a financial perspective by two principal sources, the National Library of Medicine uh, and the Reagan Street Foundation. Reagan Street Institute's role uh, in LOINC development is to serve really as the overall steward. Uh, staff at Reagan Street develop the content, add uh, terms to the database, manage that content. We uh, develop tools uh, and resources to help map to LOINC and to use LOINC. We help foster development uh, of the community of users, uh, package LOINC up and distribute it and publish it and in a variety of different contexts serve as the voice uh, of the standard uh, in many, many discussion forums. 
the LOINC website is where you can go to find all sorts of information about LOINC. Uh, obviously, you can download it there. You can sign up for mailing lists to be notified of uh, new releases. There's a user's forum, um, documentation, presentations, uh, a directory of adopters, and a whole host of other kinds of resources there. For some things, including downloading the Realma program, uh, folks have to create a user profile on the website. And this graph shows the relative growth uh, in number of users uh, to loink.org uh, since about 2008 when we started requiring registration. And you can see it's a pretty steady uh, growth curve, uh, about the, uh, the growth at a, at a rate of 14 new members uh, per day or a little over 400 new members uh, per month. And uh, looking back just over the last um, year and a half or so, uh, we've doubled in the last 19 uh, months, and it's been a pretty steady climb all the way. So there are now more than 16,000 uh, LOINC users from 145 different countries. And uh, the, the countries of origin uh, are shown in this graph here. So when you go to the LOINC website to download it, what can you get? Well, there are um, a couple of different options. You can download both LOINC and the Realma desktop mapping program all together as, as one package. Uh, that's probably the most popular thing to download. You can also get just the database table um, for loading into a large uh, uh, dictionary or other um, system. You can also download a couple of accessory files, including a file um, that uh, contains information about the panel structure and forms, uh, a multi-axial hierarchy as well. Or you can just download the Realma uh, mapping program by itself. Link is packaged up into releases that are distributed twice per year. Typically, these occur uh, in June and uh, December, just following the, uh, the laboratory committee meetings, typically. This graph, I think, is interesting. Uh, it shows the number of uh, codes in LOINC over time by release uh, since the beginning in 1995. Uh, the orange represents the portion of the terms that are laboratory terms, uh, and the blue would be those that are clinical terms. And it's about a 70-30 split uh, laboratory to clinical content. But really, I think the interesting part of this graph is the shape of the curve. Uh, and if, you know, we've been doing this now for um, more than 15 years, and I would have predicted way back when that at some point we would have reached a leveling off state. But what you can see actually is that we're um, adding new content faster uh, more recently. And I think the simplest explanation for that is that as the number of users and adopters of LOINC grows because of its submission um, and development model, there are more inputs into the system. Uh, and the growth um, occurs in different domains at different times. It's not one single area um, that's responsible for that growth, um, but uh, I think is, is um, uh, a sign that we're not quite done yet. So there's definitely lots cooking. Um, we're always adding uh, more laboratory tests as, as uh, methodology and things change. Uh, genetic reporting is a, uh, a large growth area, um, as is um, representation of standardized uh, assessments, survey instruments, uh, data sets, forms, and so forth, uh, radiology report names and structured document titles for things like discharge summaries, op notes, and so forth are also growth areas. So I'll summarize briefly the, the, the license under which LOINC is distributed. Um, and this is maybe a simple explanation. Well, no, not exactly. Uh, uh, copyright is, is actually a good thing for standards because it protects its integrity. Um, what we are most interested in is the licensing part. Uh, and so uh, let me describe that briefly. So I, I mentioned earlier LOINC is available at no cost uh, worldwide uh, forever. Uh, what you can do with it is uh, use it, uh, copy it, uh, distribute it uh, for any purpose, uh, both commercial uh, and non-commercial. 
essentially the only thing that you are prohibited from doing with the licensed material is uh, to use it to develop uh, or promulgate a different standard um, for orders or observations, the space that LOINC is in. Because obviously that would defeat the entire purpose of having a standard in the first place. Let me highlight briefly uh, some of the adoption of LOINC uh, around the world. So I mentioned the development model. Well, since 2009, about 80 organizations from 14 different countries have submitted new content uh, to LOINC. There are a number of different uh, individuals and organizations who are involved in translating LOINC into languages other than its native English. So currently there are about 19 organizations working on uh, translations. This slide shows the current translations that are in the database with the ones in blue uh, indicating the ones that it's possible to search actually in that language using the realm of program. Uh, you can search natively. The others are available for display. So there are, uh, I believe, 13 uh, translations into nine different languages. So we allow different dialects. Uh, and this graph just uh, this graphic just illustrates some of the different ways that uh, the analyte glucose has been translated uh, in different LOINC terms. We actually recently published um, a paper describing the process of translation and the tools uh, that Reagan Strip has made available to help facilitate the translation process. Uh, that article is in press in the journal Biomedical Informatics if you're interested in reading more about it. Currently, uh, translations that are in progress but not yet part of the public distribution are translations in Catalan, Dutch, French, Russian, and Turkish. In addition to the translations, LOINC has been adopted as a national standard in a number of different countries, including those uh, listed on, uh, on this slide. As well, we know of a number of large uh, production implementations that are currently using LOINC for data exchange, including the SIGA Saudi project in Sao Paulo, Brazil, many efforts under the auspices of Canada Health Infoway, the EPSOS project uh, in Europe, uh, the AP hospital system in Paris, uh, and a number of others. Uh, there are many, many more. And what's interesting about uh, even putting together a list like this is that um, I noticed that we often find out about these uh, much later, sort of after the fact, uh, and so that we know that there are a number of others bubbling up around uh, that we just haven't heard of yet. Uh, Reagan Chief and HL7 have uh, had a long history of working together to develop standards. And as I mentioned at the outset, LOINC is designed to fit um, very much within uh, the information model and the messaging structure of HL7. Uh, so um, last fall, we, the two organizations decided it would be a good idea to solidify that commitment in writing. And so we've signed a statement of understanding uh, indicating our desire to, to work together to develop coordinated standards. So within the U.S., I'll just mention briefly a couple of key highlights. Uh, in summary, um, LOINC has been adopted in a variety of contexts in the U.S. All of the big laboratories, the national reference laboratories, uh, have mapped their terms to LOINC. All of the health-related federal agencies um, have adopted LOINC in one way or another. For example, the Consolidated Health Informatics uh, Initiative. Many, many care organizations have mapped their codes to LOINC. I think it's safe to say that all the health information exchanges that, uh, at least that I know about, um, are using LOINC in, in one way or another. Many of the insurance companies have mapped uh, their codes to LOINC and, and are taking inbound um, data uh, identified with LOINC, uh, EHR vendors. Uh, and one of the things we're excited about really is um, a growing interest among instrument manufacturers um, to link uh, their their codes, their internal codes, to LOINC and provide them to their customers. One of the key things, obviously, in the field uh, of informatics that's gotten so much attention is the uh, EHR incentive program, Meaningful Use. Uh, the Phase 1 uh, Meaningful Use regulations required LOINC in a couple of different contexts, encouraged it in others, um, and this shows a, a snippet from the Federal Register naming uh, LOINC uh, for when codes are received from uh, laboratories, but also in the context of, of other things such as electronic lab uh, submission, 
of results to public health agencies uh, was named the NHL 7 implementation guide. And if you take a look at what that implementation guide says to do in OBX, you'll notice that it says uh, to use uh, LOINC as a coding system, uh, except when the test that you're sending doesn't have an equivalent LOINC code. More recently, uh, just this past fall, the Standards Committee uh, was working on creating a set of recommendations about terminologies for use in the context of quality reporting, and the Standards Committee um, adopted LOINC across a, a broad spectrum of domains, um, essentially anything that you could think of or conceive of as a question, uh, LOINC was adopted as a vocabulary for that, including um, diagnostic uh, tests and patient preferences and, and other things that you can ask as questions. And then the most recent NPRM for Phase 2 that's come out has kind of upped the ante in terms of standardization, and LOINC has been named in a couple of other additional contexts um, within that NPRM, uh, including uh, for cancer case reporting to state registries um, and uh, uh, clinical care summaries and so forth. So with that as sort of an overview, I'd like to describe uh, a little bit about the LOINC uh, naming conventions, LOINC 101, if you will. So here's an, um, an example term. Uh, I've showed you some of these b before. Uh, you can break it down uh, in, in this way. So the identifier uh, is the LOINC code. It's, a, it's, it's basically um, a number with a, a check digit that's separated by a dash. The numbers, identifiers, LOINC codes uh, have no uh, intrinsic meaning. Uh, they're basically uh, assigned uh, in order, uh, but don't have any uh, other embedded meaning in them. Uh, the, the structured name is created um, across six major axes, the component, property, timing, system, scale, and method. And I'm going to go through each one of these individually, um, but uh, of note is that the, uh, of these six axes, the method is the only one that's optional. Before we jump into that, it's also important to consider the things that are not part of the LOINC name. So none of these things will show up as part of uh, a formal LOINC name. So the reason for the test, uh, the testing instrument, specific details about the specimen and how it was collected, uh, whether this was stat or not, where the testing was done, who did it, um, essentially anything that's not essential for naming the test or identifying the test is not part of the LOINC name. And specifically, things that have other designated fields uh, in the HL7 message, such as specimen and so forth, reason for test, uh, do not show up as part of uh, the LOINC name, not because they're not important, but because there are other ways to communicate that information. So the component is the first uh, axis of the LOINC name, and this is um, where we identify the substance or entity that's being measured evaluated or observed. So you'll see things uh, like sodium, glucose, um, specific antigens or antibodies uh, are named as part of the component. Now optionally, we can specify two other subfields as part of the component. Uh, the analyte is uh, the required element, uh, but we can optionally specify things like a challenge in the case of um, glucose tolerance tests. We have an ability to specify um, the timing uh, and the amount of challenge uh, that was given, as well as in, the, in a few rare cases, the ability to signal uh, any important adjustments that were part of the measurement, uh, including, for example, adjusted to a pH of 7.4. The next axis is the property, and this is probably the most difficult one for uh, novice LOINC users to wrap uh, their minds around, uh, but the property is the characteristic of the analyte that's being measured, evaluated, or observed. Uh, and so you think about, okay, with uh, this analyte, say glucose, what is it that I'm actually measuring? And you start by thinking about, well, is it a mass? Is it a substance? Am I just counting something? Is it catalytic activity? Uh, and then it gets expressed as a fully named property. So is what I'm measuring actually a mass uh, uh, over a volume? Well, then that would be a mass concentration versus uh, a substance concentration. Or is this thing just a, an impression um, or some kind of typing thing? Uh, and so this expression of property is very closely related 
uh, to the units of measure that a particular thing, particular result uh, is reported with. Uh, so, for example, a mass concentration you'll see um, uh, at, reported uh, with units of uh, milligrams per deciliter, or something with a molar uh, amount over a volume would be a substance concentration. So the link property is kind of um, an abstraction uh, of what you see expressed in the units of measure. The timing axis is where we can identify um, the interval of time over which the observation was made. Many times this is a, just a single point in time, uh, but in other cases, such as a 24-hour urine collection, you want to specify that duration. And so the timing axis is where that kind of specification can be made. As a side note, uh, if you see something that is not a point in time, uh, those are often found with uh, properties that are rates. The system axis is where we specify the context or the specimen upon which the observation was made. So in laboratory testing, this is going to be something like serum or serum plasma, whole blood, uh, urine. Uh, for clinical measurements, it might be uh, the entire patient. Um, so this is the thing upon which the observation is made it isn't maybe directly uh, the specimen that was collected. It's what, um, what are we making this measurement on. We also have an optional ability in the system to identify cases where the measurement uh, is being uh, uh, taken or performed on something that is not the patient, uh, but that result is stored in the patient's record. So examples would be um, measurements on a blood product unit, uh, a donor, or on the fetus. And so we identify those things uh, as the super system. Uh, so if you don't see anything, you just see a, um, a system, no super system, no hat, carrot, uh, that means the patient is by default there and, 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 and assumed. Um, but this gives us a way to identify uh, these other cases um, as, as the examples you see here. The scale axis is where we can distinguish among things that are reported as quantitative values, things that are ordinal, um, that is, the results can be placed into an order or ranked. Uh, from those that are nominal, uh, the values to be drawn from an unranked collection, such as a taxonomy of bacteria, um, and things that are narrative, uh, free-form uh, paragraphs or documents of text. And as I mentioned, the method uh, is the axis, and it's the only one that's optional. And we, we specify it when it's needed because the clinical interpretation of the result is effective. Uh, we see this in, when, um, in cases where there are vastly different normal ranges or test sensitivities, uh, and it's important to distinguish how the, method, the method of uh, how that observation was performed, that test was performed. But we only specify the method um, at a relatively generic level, that is the level uh, necessary to make that uh, distinction, but not at the very detailed level of the instrument and the protocol uh, that was used uh, to do the testing. So that's the basics of how a link observation code is created. I did also want to mention that one creates co codes uh, to represent collections, um, a collection being a generic word for um, laboratory panels or batteries, uh, forms, surveys, other patient assessment instruments. We've written a couple of papers uh, describing the evolution of the data model for representing this content. And I won't go into a lot of detail today other than to mention that that um, is a reference for you. But basically the short story is that we iteratively expanded our base model, our base model for representing laboratory panels to accommodate many more um, complex attributes of these other kinds of collections. So here's an example of um, a panel in LOINC. Um, you see I've used the example of a CBC with auto differential. And a panel is an enumerated set of child elements. And so those child elements can be themselves panels, and so we can do, um, we can represent nesting, such as uh, what you see here. This overall panel has the subpanels of the hemogram and the auto differential with the child elements nested underneath each of those. But we expanded this model to uh, capture uh, and represent a big
bigger scope of things, such as the standardized assessments that are so widely used to measure all sorts of different things like screening for depression, uh, functional status, uh, and the like. The idea was that one could serve as a master question file and provide a uniform representation of all these different kinds of instruments that today mostly exist as paper forms. So we built a model to represent a whole set of other um, accessory attributes, and we were informed by um, the survey uh, development techniques and the psychometrics um, and evolved to be able to include things like the exact question text uh, and in some cases linking to uh, an enumerated answer list uh, because the meaning of the question can be so tightly bound to the allowed set of answer choices in these validated instruments. This example that I'm showing here is from the CMS required minimum data set uh, that is used in nursing home uh, settings and is part of the set of this content that is in LOINC. As I mentioned earlier, uh, you can download this content in a, in a separate format that uh, has uh, linkages between the hierarchical arrangements and these other accessory attributes, including answer lists, where they need to be. I wanted to mention some of the tools that are available for implementers who are uh, looking to use LOINC. Uh, and we've done, from the very beginning, we've built tools uh, because we want to prevent folks from going off the mapping cliff. Uh, that is, we wanted people to use LOINC and wanted to try to make it um, as efficient uh, as possible for linking local terminology to LOINC. Uh, and so one of the ways that we've been addressing uh, that and, and building some tools around it, it was based on the, the recognition um, and empirical analysis that showed what we already knew to be true by intuition. That was a few tests really give uh, most of the results. And so this is a, this is a plot of a paper uh, analyzing the lab uh, results uh, frequency um, based on the data from the Indiana Network of Patient Care. And it revealed that like 80 codes accounted for 80% of the volume uh, and more like um, uh, five to 800 or so codes accounted for 99% of the volume. And so we wanted to try to make it easy to, um, to at least look at that as a starter set, the most common codes. And so we expanded from just the INPC to include um, three different uh, large data sets from around the U.S. to develop what we call the top 2,000 results. Uh, and so we, we published this list. Um, you, can, you can download the, the list by itself. But we also uh, wrote up a mapping guide um, with specific advice and direction about mapping uh, uh, these uh, common tests. And we think it's a good starter set, a good place to begin uh, if you're uh, looking at LOINC uh, maybe for the first time. We also have available a, um, a web application that's at uh, search.loinc.org. And this is a great place if you just want to poke around and see what's in the database. You can go to this application and, and type it in. It's very uh, much kind of like Google, type in some words uh, and get results of link terms that match uh, your search queries. Uh, is also actually is available um, in multiple languages. Uh, and uh, so if you uh, desire to uh, switch your language, you can uh, say, for example, choose the Italian translation. And then um, you can search directly in that language and where possible, and the translators have provided it, we can also provide uh, the labels and so forth of this program in alternate languages. But the most common uh, and most frequently used tool that we've developed is the Rama uh, desktop mapping program. Uh, and that is uh, great for two main things. One, just browsing and seeing what's in LOINC, um, but also its main strength is in the tools it provides for mapping local terms to LOINC. So there's a great set of tools for both importing your local test catalog, your list of codes and names and units, as well as uh, exporting them back out. It provides functions for translating uh, idiosyncratic abbreviations and other um, uh, uh, funny words that you might have in your test names to words that LOINC uh, understands, and provides tools for both uh, manual and sort of semi-automated uh, mapping of your local test to LOINC. This screenshot shows what the search window looks like. Uh, has functionality very much similar to the web search that I described before, 
uh, type in some results, or type in some words, and you get the results back in a grid that's sortable. Um, the mapping screen has a similar uh, feel to it. Uh, there's a space for where your local test names are populated on the search line. You can also uh, edit what's on that line directly. Uh, and just uh, by searching, you'll get a list of, of um, link codes back. And it provides tools to, uh, to navigate through your, your uh, working set of, of terms uh, one by one, uh, finding the right code and associating it with the link code. There's also available for many of those grids and from the web application um, an expanded details uh, view for each link term uh, where we provide a whole host of other kinds of, of, of information including uh, definitions and descriptions, um, formulas where applicable, uh, what uh, panels this code might be in and so forth. And Realm is available uh, in a number of different languages as I illustrated uh, before. So let me wrap up with just a couple of, of sort of closing comments and, and big picture ideas about how to approach uh, health data exchange and mapping uh, with LINK. So the first idea is um, just to recognize that linking local terms uh, to LINK is not just an IT problem. Uh, so uh, oftentimes we, we see uh, folks that come in for and ask questions about LINK or come to trainings um, that were sort of tasked with this process and they have a strictly IT background. Uh, and clearly what's needed to be successful in this mapping activity uh, is domain expertise. It's not just a matter of, of codes, it's a matter of understanding what the test really is and what it measures. Uh, and in that regard, it's important not to assume local test names are notorious for being ambiguous about many, many different attributes that are important for knowing whether they could be aggregated or mapped to a particular link code. And in all of that, units of measure are, are critical for understanding um, understanding that, and so you definitely want to have those available to you when you're doing your mapping. Sample results can be very, very helpful for identifying the correct link scale, whether it's a quantitative result or um, a qualitative uh, result, but also having um, at your disposal when you're working on mapping local experts and even sometimes the definitive documentation, whether it's package inserts or, or operating procedures or whatever, can be extremely informative for um, being sure that what you have as your test name is really uh, what the link code is. But increasingly, I want to um, think about um, and encourage you to think about um, standardization of data as far upstream as we can get it. Um, and so what I mean by that is the, the, the physician office um, is, is one place that data standardization could occur, um, but upstream from them uh, would be the laboratory. And so if um, the laboratory had mapped their uh, terms to LOINC, then all of the places that they send data could benefit from that standardization. But even upstream from the laboratory itself is the, is the instrument manufacturers, the instruments themselves. Uh, and increasingly we're seeing a number of, uh, of those manufacturers come on board and want to provide uh, LOINC codes. And, and we think that's a great direction because everyone who buys that, um, that kit uh, or that instrument would then not have to do the detailed work of mapping. It would be available for them as well. And so we'd encourage you to ask um, uh, for that and, and begin pushing for that as well. Because of that, we're encouraged by these like the IICC, um, uh, which is a, is a consortium of, of, um, uh, of vendors in the IVD community um, who have banded together and, and, uh, and adopted the link and, and are in the process of mapping their um, local codes to LOINC. But the other important thing is to, to view this idea of, of data standardization, of mapping as a journey and not uh, just a destination. It's not a one-time deal uh, and you're going to want to think about this as an ongoing process. Some of those things include plans for updating as your testing changes, uh, which does happen, um, but uh, what happens even more frequently is changes in your local code identifiers whether you swap out your LIS, you add another facility, um, and their tests, which are maybe the same ones that you perform, have different codes assigned to them, and you've got to link them up to uh, standard codes. All these different things uh, require a view of this process um, as an ongoing thing. 
Uh, and for example, uh, replacing mappings that you might have as new versions of one come out and, and terms are, are deprecated, uh, linking to any replacement terms uh, that might be there. Uh, Realma can actually help in this process. Uh, here's an example of, of um, a function in Realma that can find any terms you've mapped to deprecated codes. Another idea is to think about this um, mapping activity. Maybe you don't have the resources to bite it all off in one foul swoop. Uh, and so you might be thinking about, well, how could I prioritize? If I can't do everything, what should I start with? Uh, and so local or national policies might help you think about um, prioritizing mapping subsets. For example, maybe starting with uh, the most common results and expanding that to, um, say, the elements of analytics. Uh, that are uh, some things, like, for example, the differential where some elements are very common, others are more rare, maybe you want to explode them out to all of those, and or um, things that are reportable uh, to public health. Um, but there, there are a variety of ways you can do it, and I'm not saying one is right or wrong, but uh, thinking about how to prioritize can be, um, can help reduce the, the, um, the anxiety or the worry of, of this as being a, a big daunting task. But really, there's no other way to, to start than just to jump in. Um, I think now is as good a time as any um, to, uh, to map to LOINC, and hopefully this overview have given you at least a little bit of a taste of, of what it's all about. Um, and with that, I would say uh, happy uh, LOINCing, and um, I'm glad that you joined in today, and I will uh, turn it over to the moderator for questions. Um, thank you so much, Daniel, for um, this wonderful um, webinar. Um, I have learned a lot. It's terrific. And uh, thanks, everyone, online join us for the, to this webinar. And now let's start the questions. And before I start the questions, I want to let you know, and um, I saw some people also asked, um, this webinar is recorded, so the video will be available on the email website later. And I think, Daniel, you will put this on the um, LOINC website, right? Yes, we'd love to put it on the LOINC website as well. Okay, okay, so uh, please read, uh, raise your hand and then I will unmute you and let you ask your question. So you can raise your hand using the uh, GoToWebinar software, the panel, so I, I can see you here and then ask your question. Okay. Um, Singil, go ahead. Uh, yeah, my question is, uh, what are the barriers to uh, wider uh, adoption of LOINC in, in more ESR systems or clean databases? Um, so the question Oh, what are the, the large barriers to adoption like in EHR systems? Yes. Uh, well, I think there are a number of ones. Num the, the primary one, uh, it takes uh, work and effort to uh, map local terms. Uh, and, you know, EHR systems are, are awesome, uh, but sometimes uh, they're viewed as uh, vessels. But, you know, the real value and you can get inside them uh, all the data, right? So all the support capabilities and um, depend on having a set of data available to you. And those data come from many, many different sources. Um, I would argue that um, the, uh, the office practice EMR is not the best place or the most efficient place to do the standardization, uh, you know, because uh, there's probably multiple feeds coming in, and it would be great if all the feeds coming in actually uh, had uh, standard identifiers uh, with them already. Um, and so, uh, so it's it's work, um, and uh, I think like all standard standardization efforts, um, there's sort of a, a need for a critical mass before it becomes um, super. Um, uh, clear that this is um, a valuable thing. But as soon as you want to start uh, exchanging data between more than one party, I think you bump, you bump into it. But I'd say that the clearest barrier is it, it takes work, main expertise, uh, and that costs money. Thank you. Okay. Um, Jacqui, um, please go ahead.
Jenny. Yes. Yeah, please go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I, um, I guess I just got unmuted. <clears throat> so you did not hear any of what I just said? No, we didn't. Sorry. My mistake. <laughs> In trying to provide uh, mapping for our clients, one of our uh, greatest obstacles is getting the correct data. And you mentioned that units of measure is a very important um, uh, component to, to receive. I guess my question is, do you have any recommendations uh, for how to approach or how to map when you don't have complete sets of data? Or would you say that it's unmappable if you do not receive um, things like specimen and units of measure? That's a great question, a very common um, problem or challenge. Uh, and I think um, there's a lot of um, potential for um, simply ch choosing the wrong mapping um, if you are basing uh, it on incomplete information. Uh, and so um, we've done some work to document the different ways that things are incomplete, and, and you probably know them from your experience as well, uh, lack of specimen type and so forth. And you might be able to, you think you might be able to um, assume, but we've also run into the, the case where you ask one laboratory that has a, a code identified for a certain analyte, and you ask them what the specimen is, and they say, oh, you know, it's always plasma. And then you go to the next shop and you ask them the same thing and say, oh, everybody knows it's always serum, right? Uh, and so, um, so I think you run the risk of, of, um, of uh, choosing sort of the wrong thing in, in the space of, of ambiguity. So, so we encourage two, I mean, we encourage two things. One is to get your hands on as much data as you can. Uh, and that's why one of the recommendations uh, that we have is that um, actually working from real uh, HL7 outbound messages uh, can be uh, very, very helpful, especially when compared to just mapping, say, from a test catalog or service catalog alone, because you have then, and Rama actually provides tools, you can point it at a million messages or so, and it'll create a synthetic master file and extract out, you know, the reported units of measure, uh, which sometimes are in a different file uh, in the, the test catalog and get sample values uh, and so forth. But the other piece you know, get your hands on as much data as you can. Um, I think having uh, access to um, the the domain expert to perform the test uh, is often very, very um, uh, essential as well. Uh, and sometimes it's not available, um, but um, it, it certainly can be a big, a big help. So I, I can sympathize with you, um, and, but uh, but I think. Um, Without complete information or knowing what this really, really measures, um, there's always a chance uh, that um, you'll you'll guess wrong. Thank you. Um, anybody else has questions? We have okay. We are right on time. So, um, so we will turn off the webinar and thank you, um, everyone, for joining us for today's webinar. Um, if you have questions, you can uh, email us or email Dr. Berryman.